Hello, welcome back to another episode of Javelin Journeys. Um, I've had some fantastic responses so far to the show, and we're getting better at um, getting the content out to more people all across lots of different platforms and all sorts of stuff going on. Um, there's been quite a lot of good feedback. I'm really pleased with um, the, the feedback that we've had. We've had some really good um, recent announcements. We've started the Red Line podcast with the guys over at Sales Driven. Um, big shout out to Shin and uh, Antoine for uh, bringing me in on that one and, and launching that with me. Um, I think it's been really fun. It's been really fun to do. So whereas Javelin Journeys is more about me and Javelin content, content market and content management and using video to really accelerate your business, um, the Red Line podcast then focuses on um, a lot of focus on sales and outbound, um, cold email, cold calling, and talking with guests who've been there and done all that. Um, tech companies, CEOs, founders who've, who've made their millions, who've made their, you know, they've had their exits, multiple exits in some cases, and back in the thick of it. Um, so it's interesting. You know, we had um, Amir Reiter on the other day, fantastic guest, um, absolutely just blew me away in terms of um, pretty much every sentence that he came out with was a quote. Um, really fantastic foresight and, and obviously been there and done things. Um, you know, my, my big takeaway from that was he said that, um, <laughs> I love this bit, was that he said that um, companies who hire salespeople treat them well because if you treat your salespeople badly, they will become a weapon. And I love that. And he backed it up with a story that he used to sell um, water coolers into businesses. And the business that he was working for stiffed him on his payments and commission. So the guy went out and he bought a container from China of water coolers and then hit them hard. And I think that's just an amazing story of, and you know, I see that time and time again in the sales community. Like It's a very, very creative community. And I'm very lucky to have come from so many different mixed backgrounds. Um, I really enjoy... Um, being able to get involved in conversations no matter which side of the fence I'm in. So I've come from a leadership background. I came from retail um, and I've managed, you know, I've managed right there on the on the shop floor, putting stock out alongside, you know, I've been till one, putting stock out with cashiers, serving customers, dealing with shoplifters, being threatened with knives, um, all that sort of jazz. Right the way up to national strategy for loss prevention um, and being involved on a, on, a, on a national scale in terms of how we help detect internal theft. What does that look like? What are the procedures? Then I came out and I'm working, found myself working in sales, right? Like no experience, no, no training, no mentor, um, just kind of left to get on with things. And I really enjoyed that as well. Um, there's elements that I really enjoy and there's elements that I didn't enjoy so much. Um, and that's where I gravitate towards marketing, right? Because I'm a big believer that sales and marketing are just intertwined. And the more people understand sales and marketing, then the stronger their commercial savvy is in terms of influencing more people, right? So a lot of people become sales specialists. That's fine. You know, like play to your strengths, play to who you are, play to where you're at in your career and things. But if you think you don't need to understand marketing to be a salesperson, you're wrong because you absolutely do. Because it's, it's, you know, it plays so many parts as to what you do. And a lot of salespeople do understand marketing. They just don't appreciate that it is, you think it's just another facet of sales. And I guess to an extent it is, right? Um, but then you've got marketers who don't appreciate sales either. And they don't want to know, you know, like they, they just think salespeople are there to ruin their lives and, and sell things that don't exist and talk about the brand in ways they'd rather they didn't. Well, the fact of the matter is, for a lot of salespeople, especially the good ones, if they're talking about your brand in a certain way, it's because that's what works. And marketers need to learn to understand that, that salespeople are on that front line with the clients and prospects and leads day in, day out. And there is nobody that knows better what works with the clients than those guys. Marketing are the creative guys that come up with all the stuff. That's fantastic. And it, but there needs to be a 360 loop in there. And I'm so fortunate to have come from a background where I've been able to practice all of those and really understand where it comes from. It just gives me a really unique perspective. So going back to Redline Podcast, you know, um, my side of things is to is to put the, the, the so what on the end of some of the sales conversations um, and to give that market and perspective. So it's been, you know, it's been really cool. 
Um, we've got some amazing guests lined up. You know, we've got some market and senior leaders that might lined up, like people like Chris Walker from Refine Labs. We've got Todd Caponi, um, Sales Mellon, former Salesforce CRO. So you know, some fantastic personalities. I, and I remember remember Todd telling me a story um, when he was in a boardroom, and he and he got into an argument with one of the other um, one of the other C suite and went around and like kicked his chair in frustration. <laughs> like these guys are real people. They've done it. Um, and I love learning, you know, the, like people ask me, why do I do video content? And it started out because it was the most efficient way of doing my job. That's how I learned to do it and why I started doing it. What it actually turned into is it's just really, really cool getting the opportunity to more or less be paid to sit and listen to other people's opinions and experience and thoughts. And because there is so much to learn from other people out there. And I've, I find it fascinating. You know, one of my clients is a guy called Joe Leach. Um, obviously, my background is in retail leadership. And, and Joe is a coach for CEOs um, in retail and tech companies and startups. And he's, he's kind of retail and tech is his niche. Um, and it was really easy to work with Joe because I understand intrinsically all the things that he's pointing holes at. And you know, I'm quite keen in. Um, self-development from a leadership perspective. I don't think anybody's an expert at leadership. You kind of, <laughs> everybody's on the ladder somewhere. You've got to figure it out. Um, and so much of what Joe says is just on the nail. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, tells a really good story. Well, it tells a few, to be fair. Um, one of the really good stories that I like was um, he compares um, business with his six-year-old daughter. Um, and he said, you know, my, my daughter goes out um, and every day before we go out, I check the weather forecast. So, because if it's going to rain, I'm going to take an umbrella and then she doesn't get wet. But eventually she's got to learn that she needs to check the weather forecast for herself. So, you know, one day I'm going to just take her out. I know it's going to rain. I'm just going to let her get wet. And she's going to ask me, Daddy, why, why am I getting wet? Why haven't you brought me an umbrella? Because, well, because you need to start checking the weather forecast yourself. That's cool. Um, but he also, the flip side of that is he says, likewise, you know, if my daughter's going to step out in front of a bus, I'm not going to let her learn the lesson the hard way. I'm going to pull my daughter back. Um, and he compares that to startup founders and tech founders um, and just young, just young founders and inexperienced founders in general in that um, they tend to see buses everywhere. And actually, a lot of them just tend to be umbrellas. And I just thought that's a really powerful analogy. I, I love that. It's very easy to grasp the concept of what he's saying. I always, I always admire people that come up with really good analogies because I'm rubbish at analogies. Um, I have to ask ChatGPT for my analogies. <laughs> um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today um, is around perfectionism, and it kind of comes out the back of a lot of those conversations. Um, we spun up Redline Sales Podcast in probably three weeks. I'm still tinkering with it now, but we spun it up in two to three weeks. Uh, and I'm talking posting for the podcast, content for the podcast, deciding what we were going to talk about on it, what the format was going to be, creating a website for it to get it up and running, um, blog articles. I think we've got 30 or 40 blog articles up there. Um, getting all the social media accounts set up and hooked up to scheduling tools so we can get the content out to people, getting a newsletter set up, mailing list. Um, you know, getting things like Google Analytics set up, a domain for sending emails, making sure the email domain was warmed up and all the all the spam filters were turned off and everything so that we land in the inbox if we do want to email people, all those sorts of things in like three weeks. And it was born out of a couple of things. Like one is there's just a trust between the three of us, right? That that we just we all have our niche, mine's generally technology um, and process, and I just get stuff done. I'm a doer. Um, you can't employ a doer, people, because we're already too busy doing things. Um, so, yeah, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if we were aiming for perfection all the time. And that's what a lot of startups and that's what a lot of small businesses aim for. That you, you know, your MVP should embarrass you a little bit, when you, especially when you look back on it in, in retrospect. So for me, you know, it wasn't a case of how do we make this podcast perfect from day one. It's how do we get this out there fast in a way that still adds value as much as we can, how do we get it as right as we can and how do we make it as efficient as we can and automated as we can from day one. And then we build on it from there. We iterate. 
and that's what a lot of businesses miss that bit. They miss the, um, you know, that, that failing fast, the iteration, what works, what doesn't, and allowing people the opportunity to just make those mistakes because that's where you learn. If you're in a business and everything goes right all the time, the corporate world can be like that sometimes because there's so many guidelines and micromanagers and everybody kind of stifling you. You fail to learn the lessons that you need to learn to be really good at what you're doing because all you're doing is following somebody else's footsteps. Um, and I really struggle with that. Um, <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I left corporate world, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, just kind of don't be afraid to get out there early and make those mistakes. Um, but make sure they're umbrella mistakes, not buses, right? Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep referring to that. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be hitting my son with that for ages. I'm going to be like, is this an umbrella or a bus? <laughs> um, so the other, the other thing on that was, you know, Amir Rita was on the show the other day and, and in one of the things that he was talking about was failing fast and failing forwards. And I've been a big fan of this for ages, right? But what he, what he said made a lot of sense was that if he'd failed faster, he would have saved his money, saved his business a lot of money because by hanging on to things that needed to be killed off or that needed to fail quicker, he was just throwing money away. He was just burning money that he didn't need to burn. Um, and again, hooks up back to something else that Joel Leach says, which is around running faster every problem, take it head on. Don't let it fester. Don't let it build up. Just get involved with it. Get it done. Because, you know, the early that you deal with a challenge in a business, the smaller the challenge is to deal with. You can eat the frog, eat it early. Eat it first thing in the morning, swallow it whole. <laughs> you know, and I think that's a great story. You know, like don't, don't be afraid to eat the frog. Eat it first. Just have that you know, that ethos that I'm going to get involved in this. And I remember back in, you know, in retail, when I was, when I was in retail, we were talking about conflict situations and conflict was everywhere in retail, right? I've got conflict with my manager. I've got conflict with my staff, conflict with the customers, you know, conflict with my immediate management team. Like it's just everywhere, especially discount retail, right? It's high pressure. Um, it's really tough to do that right. Um, and the one thing that I, you know, it took me a long time to learn the lesson, it, you know, a lot longer than it should have. Everybody out there who's, who's maybe experienced me as a leader, right, hands up here. Right, I didn't learn that lesson quick enough was that conflict needs to be managed quicker. If you see something happening, you need to get involved in it quickly because otherwise you're just building a time bomb that's just in your hands and it will go off. It always goes off. It'll go off in the worst possible time, in the worst possible way, and it'll go off in your hands and you'll look like an idiot. So, you know, it, in, in as much as that, that example is talking about leadership in general, it's also talking about business, right? Is don't, don't wait for things to become a problem. If you see a problem, smash it, <laughs> Hulk smash, um, get rid of that problem, get on to the next thing, because that's just going to, it's going to massively hold you back and um, it's going to cost you money you don't have. And, and you can't afford to make those sorts of, you know, decisions late and slowly. Um, I think the other, the other thing is like, as I've been building out Javelin, I've been building out Redline and I've been working with Shane on, on Ideas Exchange and lots of different bits and pieces. Um, you know, we're having some fantastic luck. I've got some amazing clients lined up. We've got some great guys that we're working with already. The guys at Custerian, Simon and Nicola, we've got Joe, we've got uh, the guys at, well, you know, so I can't talk about, <laughs> we've got the guys at Smarter AI, um, Mike Smith and Co. Um, we've got some fantastic people that we're working with, got some great people coming up. But as I'm building all this out, the one thing I keep coming back to is you know, I'm using tools that I've used for two, three years or come back to using tools that I used a while ago and, and everything's different. Everything breaks. Tech is notorious for being really fickle, right? You've got to be on top of it all the time. You've got to be like, oh, well, this worked this way last week, but now they've updated the platform. Now it works this way. And you've got to get into a whole new process and you, or your, your to-do guide now doesn't work. So you've got to redo some of your to-do guide like how, what's your process for doing this workflow and how does this work and maybe you need to change it maybe you need to and then considering do i need to bring another piece of kit in to, to automate certain parts of this what more can i do to make this more efficient can i automate more of it and what do i sacrifice by automating it and i just think i love doing those sorts of things by the way like that's my bread and butter um oh, you might not you might not think that if you walked in on me in the middle of a change happening but <laughs> But I do. I I enjoy the experimenting with things. Um, 
and with my ADHD, sometimes I can, it, sometimes it works in my favor. So like I can, you know, I'll, I'll be up till two, three o'clock in the morning finishing things off because I'm down that rabbit hole, the hype fixation. And I just can't, I know there's no point in me going to bed until I've done to a certain extent what I was trying to do and, and prove to myself whether it's going to work or not. Um, I just don't understand why most people put up with that or would think that they could put up with that because it's just a horrendous experience a lot of the time. Um, and that's, you know, again, like I talk about the reasons why I built Javelin. I built Javelin because I don't want startups to have to deal with those sorts of problems. Um, and they become real problems if you're not in the thick of that platform, program, product, whatever it is, all the time. I'm in the depths of my products all the time. I know how they work. I know how they should work. I know what the changes have been. I know what happens if this bit falls off or that bit falls over or this happens. Or I can't, I've got that repository in my head. And I'm, you know, at some point I'm going to start sharing that out to some of the team. But I just think as a business owner or a business leader, you've got a billion other things that you need to be doing. Um, so if you're not going to work with Javelin, you know, you need to find that person who can do that for you who has other skill sets that you can utilize in the business. And it needs to be one of your early hires. You need to find somebody who can take two bits of technology and just make them work and be really creative about how they get them to work. And I think a lot of businesses miss that. And that's why they end up shying away from things like social media and content marketing, because they see that as something that they need to do down the line. That's for, you know, five years from now, or it's when we're revenue positive or, or when Series A is landed and all those sorts of things, it's crap. It's not. You need to be building it before you use it. And I say this to people on networking events as well. It's not just about, you know, javelin content. It's your social media profiles in general. People need to build them before they use them. If you're trying to take social capital out of your social media accounts before you've built that social capital up, well, you're going to go nowhere because you've got no reciprocity to draw on. You've done no favors for other people. You haven't helped other people. And you will get some luck with that. And some people make a, you know, some people seem to make a career out of putting very little effort in, taking from people and then running off and just doing their own thing. And I'm, you know, I've never been a big fan of that side of things. But, um, you know, to have built up that social capital, help people, advice, this is how we do it. This is how you should do it. Yes, I'll meet with you and discuss this, that. Just the other day, I met up with Steve Sullivan. Um, he's a contact center compliance expert. Well, that's how I'm going to call him, right? He'll, he'll, he'll cry if he thinks I've called him an expert, but he is. He, he really knows his compliance stuff inside and out. He's got a newsletter, sends it out on a weekend. And he wanted to know what more he could be doing with it because like, it's gotten stale now. He's lost track of why he started doing the newsletter in the first place. And I knew, like, I know Steve's never going to be one of my customers. Like, it's just, like, he's a cons he's an independent consultant. He, he does it, he does all right for himself. But my business is probably aimed more at the B two B businesses as opposed to um, people who contract with lots of different places. I mean, you know, it works for some, doesn't work for a lot. And and I knew just wouldn't, you know, that's not what the conversation was about with Steve. It was about how we can, you know. Use, use my ADHD to come up with some creative ideas for him as to what he could be doing. And we sat and chatted for half an hour. It was fun. I enjoyed, like, I enjoy problem solving people's problems sometimes. Um, and he walked away and he was like, you know, thanks, because that's that's been really helpful. You've, you've given me some really good ideas. And Steve, if you're watching this, I hope you've been doing some of them. Bank holiday has been in the way, so I'll give you some, give you some juice, but um, I want to see them put into action, right? Um, and then... You know, on the back of that conversation with Steve, he puts up a post on LinkedIn and goes, oh, by the way, I've just had a chat with Paul Banks, Javelin Content. You know, if you need anything, you should definitely go and talk to him. Inbound message comes in from a guy that I've been chasing for three years in my old job. And, he, and like, he was going to have a meeting with me way back in the day. Um, then he got promoted to a global CX position. And, and he was just like, I got it right. His diary got crazy. Um, he must have had vendors upon vendors upon vendors in his email. And uh, I, I know what that's like. There's no hard feelings, right? And this guy went to message me. Well, he went to connect with me first. And he saw that we were already connected. And then he went to message me. And he read all my messages to him. You know, And, I'm, and there's a few in there. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek, right? Like kind of things like, look, uh, you know, what have you got to lose? Um, if, if you have a conversation with me and you're bored or you're not interested, I will pay for your coffee. And it's... It's one of those things. It's like tongue in cheek, 
like we live nowhere near each other. I'm not really going to buy him a coffee, but the fact that I'm trying to make a joke of things and keep it light rather than go for the hardcore sales pitch, you know, it works for some people, right? And, and I find that approach better than hardcore sales. Um, so he came to me kind of cap in hand and went, Do you know what, like fair play to you. Like I, I, apologies for not responding earlier, but you know, I read Steve's message and me and Steve know each other really well. And, you know, I'd like to see if we can do something together for the two businesses. And do you know what? It's a perfect fit. I love it. And, and the guy's exactly the sort of person I want to work with. I would never have got that conversation. I wouldn't have even thought to go to this guy had I not been putting social capital in the bank. So hands on heart, everyone, if you're building a startup, it's the community that you build around you. Um, that comes from content marketing, comes from video content, comes from your socials. It comes from networking. Um, it's not just about investment funding, product building, and you know all the, all the financials, payroll, all those sorts of things, right? That's part of it. Unfortunately, as a, as a founder, you also get to do the other stuff as well. Some people are really good at it. Some people really enjoy doing it. And, and I enjoy doing it. It's just fun. Like I love helping other people. But, I've, you know, ever more as a founder now, I'm conscious of my time more than I ever have been, you know, like I'm going to have a half hour conversation with this person here, but actually I really need to get this bit of work done over here, or I need to get a new blog post put out, or I need to record a new podcast episode. And again, you know, I said it, said it in the last episode, right? I even procrastinate over doing my own content. So the fact that I procrastinate means I know people who are less socially media savvy than me or less technology savvy than me are going to really struggle with that. Come and have a chat or follow the content. See if I can help you find a way to automate what you're doing or find better tools to do what you're doing. Um, the next bit that I wanted to, to, to focus on was um, storytelling in ROI. All right. And I come from a business where storytelling and ROI was paramount. We, we, that was the one thing that separated us really strongly from our competitors was being able to tell our clients how much money we were likely to be able to save them on a conservative estimate. And people often go about that the wrong way because they talk about it in terms of immediate benefits. Um, you know, I'm going to, I don't know if I want to, if I want to put it into a javelin content analogy, um, you know, I'm going to produce video content, which means, uh, you don't need to employ a, a marketing executive yourself. You're going to pay us instead of paying them, right? That's not really a, it's not really a strong ROI. It's, it's part of it though. Um, and sometimes people miss the obvious as well. It's those sorts of things that's right in front of it. But one of the things that I have had to learn how to do since moving into my own business was, especially in the marketing world and the sales world, right? Everybody talks about lead gen. Everybody expects you to be able to see, oh, how many clients are you going to put on my books this year? Well, you know, how strong is the wind? How long is a piece of string? I don't know. Um, it's different for everyone. It's different for every brand. It's different for every message that a client's got. How strong is their proposition? What's their value that they add? Is it a big market? What's their TAM? You know, who's their ideal clients? How senior are they? There's, there's thousands and thousands of different things that play into the likelihood for, for generating ROI. Um, but what I have, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks trying to figure out how I can talk about that because it's something I'm conscious that I struggle with when I'm, I'm talking to my clients sometimes. I know I know that there's a clear business case. I struggle to articulate it because still early days with Javelin, right? Um, and I've come from selling contact center, speech analytics, and conversation analytics. It's a very different world. You know, with, with conversation analytics, I can tell you how many conversations we can process, how much it's going to cost you. And in the particular business case that you're looking at, here's, here's what the savings are likely to be by knowing, I don't know, how often your agents said sorry to customers. Well, we know what. You know, we can measure what um, NPS, like a net promoter score, is worth to you as a business. If it goes up by one, how much how much more money are we going to make as a business because we're retaining more clients, those sorts of things. And I've had to do that same process with Javelin. And I think it's really valid to talk about um, doing that for your clients as well, right? Um, so I think any business that's out there, especially startups and, and tech businesses, don't just tell them the immediate savings and then assume they know what that implies. Go to the nth level of building that out for them. So one of the things I talk about is 
how I don't focus on what I call K1 metrics, right? Um, K1 metrics for most people are things like engagement, right? Views, um, impressions, how many likes I'm getting, how many comments I'm getting. And they're great. Like they're a, they're a short-term stock gap measure and they're an indicator as to how many eyeballs you're getting. And obviously you want to increase them, right? Like, like I'm not belittling those metrics. You want to increase them um, as much as possible. But it's still based on your target market. So if you're in a really niche market and you're only getting a small amount of views, maybe that's okay. Because if they're the right eyeballs, who cares? If you're a general market who can copyright and you can do website design and SEO, well, yeah, you should be getting much higher views because your content is like, there's a lot more competition out there. There's a lot more businesses that need, every business needs your service. You know, it's a huge addressable market. You should be getting much higher views on what you're doing. Um, so what I class as K1 metrics for, for us at Javelin, and, and I think I mentioned this before, is around the, the quality of pipeline that you have as a result of working with us. So there will be, without doubt, there will be leads that come inbound because they've seen you on LinkedIn and they want to be involved with what you're doing. That being said, when it's a complex sale that's six to nine months or longer for a deal cycle, that's probably irrelevant because... Like they're not going to come to you because they've seen you on LinkedIn. I was having this chat with a with a BPO the other day, an outsourcer, and they're absolutely right. Like, you know, a big retail client with a hundred call center seats, for example, it's not going to come to an outsourcer because they saw their CEO talking about, um, you know, ESG policy on LinkedIn. It's not going to happen. But what it does do is it gets into that person's head. This is where we get into dark social and things like what Chris Walker talk about quite a lot of refining labs and, and around attribution, demand attribution, and um, you know, capturing where your demand actually comes from. Most people, if you ask them, they'll say they came to you via your website, which is probably true. But why did they go to the website? Why were you top of mind? Well, because probably, hopefully, if you're doing your job right, because they saw you on LinkedIn, because they saw your posts saw your video, they saw you, started to trust you because they heard what you were saying and they liked what you were saying. You resonated with them. You understand their problems. You talk about their problems all the time. And you talk about how you'd solve their problems or have solved their problems or will solve their problems. And you get filed away, right? Like bit by bit. And this is not a quick process. This is why I talk to my clients about K2 and K1 metrics. Like this takes three to six months minimum to start to build up that... Um, changing people's brain thinking that, that how they think of you on uh, like you know somebody called it brainwashing the other day uh, if you want to go with that all right then brainwashing people it's not it's not brainwashing but it's helping them become familiar with you and that's what's important to do video with people with people who are in the business who've been in the trenches who've done the job because you don't get that same add-on with a brand with an image with a company image with text right People need to know what I look like to be able to use my voice in the head when I'm writing a text post, which I did for a long time. I just wrote text posts. I can write text posts all day long. But when people can see me talking about it in their head, well, it creates a whole new quality of post, like a whole bunch of trust that comes out of doing that with them. So... For me, you know, going going back to the ROI, so I talk about it like is is, is your pipeline. Like I'll I'll improve your market and qualified lead, so your inbound initial message to sales qualified lead. So yes, we can help this person. We should put a proposal in front of them. I can improve that because all of a sudden the people that are coming to you are more highly qualified. They understand you. They know who you are. They they, they get your authority and they like you before they've even come to your door rather than you having to build that up in the early stages, which you lose a lot of people if you have to do that. And also, you know, and this is the bit that people will forget about, is I remove the bad fit people because they see you on LinkedIn and some of them will decide, actually, I'm not working with that guy. I don't like what he just said. That's crap. He's not true. I don't agree with it. That's my opinion. And they're entitled to it. That's fine. That's cool. It's good. Because not everybody is your client. And anybody who thinks everybody is their client, well, you're just going to boil the ocean. You're not going to find who your real good fit clients are. So, you know, flip things on its head and think about not just what you provide directly in terms of ROI, but what do you help people avoid by, 
by providing that. And add that into your calculations because it's fair game, right? If you did a deep dive time and motion study, you know, you brought in one of the big four consultancies, you're damn right they would be looking at those sorts of things. You know, I talk about um, talk, talk about that part of the stage, right, that, that part of the pipeline, but I also talk about, you know, I help you avoid wasted conversations because it doesn't go anywhere because they've done their research before they come to your door because they can do that because you're out there so much. They've got an idea as to whether they want, you know, how much money do you waste in, in meetings where it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't go any further. You have that half-hour discovery call then, then, and then they don't quite understand it properly. So then they come back for another half-hour call. Then you do a demo, that's another hour or half an hour. You know, then then they think, oh, you know, well, we'll get a proposal off them anyway and see what it's like. So you do the proposal. God knows how long that takes you to do. Um, put it in front of them. And then you never hear from them again because they were a bad fit in the first place. So, you know, talk about those sorts of things with your clients when you're talking about ROI and add it into your calculations. But be really, like, what I've had to learn is just be conservative. So I can't tell people exactly how much money I'm going to save them. Exactly. Because every business is different, right? But I can work on a on a on a on a conservative estimate that they can then scale up or down based on where their business is at. So I would say to them, you know, if your product sitting near, you know, if it costs your clients ten thousand pounds a year, and I can, you know, you you convert in ten clients a year at the moment, so that's you know, hundred thousand pound in revenue you're getting at the moment, but. Um, you need to talk to a hundred clients a year to to get to that point. So you know you're actually wasting ninety lots of what four or five hours at a time. What's that hourly rate on there? And I give them an idea as to how much money it actually save them conservatively, so that they can then scale that up and down in their heads. But if you know that information, that's even more powerful because then you can give them that exact idea. And you know I would encourage anybody who's doing like high ticket sales like you want to start building that early in your process tell them what your customer journey is and tell them i'm gonna talk to you today we're gonna we're gonna figure out whether we're a good fit or not if we decide at the end of today we're a good fit the next step is for me to ask you to fill in an nda and we're going to get some some basic information from you the reason i'm going to do that is because unlike our competitors i'm going to build a really strong compelling roi case for you I'm going to tell you how much we're going to cost you. I'm going to tell you how much we're going to save you. But to do that, I need some, not confidential information, but some top level info that will help me generate that, that business case for you. Too many businesses are scared of doing that. You know, they're just like, oh, here's our software. Isn't it great? Look at all these flashy buttons and look at this knob that turns on here. And uh, and you get this file out. It's brilliant. Eey. If I'm a client sat looking at that, I'm like, so what does that mean to me? But somebody says to me, Paul, it's going to cost you 10 grand a year for this and we're going to save you 100 grand a year. Psst, do it. Take my money. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, hopefully, that's been interesting. Being a little bit off topic today, being a little bit sort of um, businesses and startups and, and leaderships, just sorts of things that have been in my mind this week. But hopefully, it's been useful for people. And again, as usual, um, you know, I love hearing from people who watch the show, love people who are, you know, especially my, outside of my network as well. You know, if you, if you don't know each other, drop me a line. Love to have a chat. Um, Paul at javelincontent.com. Give us a subscribe. Hey, using that button again. Um, hope you all have a fantastic week and I will see you soon.